Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to Brookings. My name is Martin Indick. I'm the uh, John C. Whitehead Distinguished Fellow in International Diplomacy in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. A very long title, almost as long as some of the panelists' titles that we have today, as you'll hear. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, moderate this event, which is a joint uh, event of the Brookings Center on the US and Europe and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs. But we're not here to discuss Henry Kissinger today, or at least not directly. We're here to discuss Zbigniew Brzezinski and this wonderful new book called Zbigniew Brzezinski, America's Grand Strategist. It is written by a former colleague and great friend of Brookings, Justin Vais, uh, and uh, he is back here to make this presentation. He uh, went on himself to uh, try to apply the ideas that he developed at Brookings uh, as director of the policy planning staff of the French Quai d'Orsay, the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs, uh, where he now serves. Uh, he, before that, served as Director of Research at our Centre for the US and Europe, uh, as well as Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program. Uh, joining us on the panel to discuss this book is uh, Frank Gavin, who is the Giovanni Agnelli Distinguished Professor and Director of the aforesaid Henry A. Kissinger Centre for Global Affairs at SAIS, and Mary Elise Surratt who is the Marie-José and Henry Kravis Distinguished Professor of Historical Studies at the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at, at SAIS. Uh, and we are joined by a good friend uh, of my own and, and of Brookings, David Ignatius, the prize-winning columnist for the Washington Post, who has managed to toggle his demands for appearances on MSNBC uh, with uh, this panel today, for which we're very grateful, David. Uh, this is a great book. I love this book. Uh, and by the way, you can uh, buy your own copy uh, when you leave. Uh, outside the doors, there's somebody there uh, to sell you one, and I'm sure Justin will be happy to autograph it for you. I love this book because, uh, in a way, as only a Frenchman could do, uh, it focuses on the intellectual journey of uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, from uh, its very origins through what he calls the Cold War University, uh, days at Columbia to his days in the White House and then, of course, beyond where he became such a dominant public policy uh, intellectual. Uh, and uh, throughout... Justin manages to weave a story of how ideas and their intellectual origins interact with the real world of policy. Uh, and in, in a way, that is what uh, Brookings and, and uh, Seiss uh, are all about. And so it becomes a very interesting uh, journey uh, into the mind and actions of one of the most important uh, foreign policy intellectuals and, and uh, policy makers uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, so uh, it's a consequential book. And uh, Justin has done, I think, a fabulous job, beautifully translated too, uh, of uh, describing and analyzing uh, this journey. So without ado, uh, Justin, please. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, you can imagine uh, what a pleasure it is to be back at Brookings, uh, to see many familiar faces, uh, and I'm very grateful uh, for the Kissinger Center and, uh, and Brookings, of course, but also for the panelists for uh, agreeing to discuss the book. Uh, I think there are very different uh, themes uh, to, be, to be discussed. I'll try to concentrate on a few uh, points in this, uh, in this short uh, introduction. Um, 
because beyond the fascinating life story of, of an immigrant uh, who was born in 1928, came when he was uh, 10 years old uh, to uh, Canada first and then uh, to Harvard in 1950, uh, became a citizen in 1958. Um, so beyond this, this uh, life story, there's also the story of Washington and of the uh, Washington ecosystem or the Washington milieu uh, that uh, people like Brzezinski and Kissinger pioneered. And that's part of the um, story of the book is how uh, the US foreign policy elite was uh, rejuvenated, renewed, changed in the course of the 50s and 60s, and how what had been uh, the dominant cast uh, at the time, um, uh, you know, big influence on, on, on this book uh, was Walter Isaacson's The Wise Men, uh, who was uh, a portrait of a group of um, uh, policymakers uh, uh, who were who really uh, created the American uh, world uh, in the mid-century? Avril Harriman, uh, Chip Bolan, John McCloy, Robert Lovett, Dean Acheson. Uh, these men really created the American world, but they were not foreign policy specialists. They were lawyers. Uh, industrialists, um, uh, 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 people from the business world, who by virtue of their business knew the rest of the world and knew uh, how international relations uh, worked and, and thereby became advisors uh, to Roosevelt, uh, to Truman uh, and others and, uh, and once again created that, uh, that, that, that American uh, world. These wise men, gave way in the 1960s to a new group of people. This new group uh, had studied international relations and international relations became a nascent discipline in American university because of the rise of America to globalism, because of the needs. So after 1941 and 1945 and, and, and the Cold War, um, the necessities of administering a far-flung empire for the US uh, uh, drove Washington to fund what we came to call the Cold War University. Uh, that's when things like area studies were created, uh, when international relations really uh, took off, simply because of the needs uh, of Washington and uh, through large uh, funding uh, grants to universities like uh, Columbia, uh, Harvard, and Stanford. And indeed, that's the milieu when, uh, where uh, uh, Brzezinski arrived in the 1950s. And one of the origins of the book is that I realized that in the 1950s at Harvard University, you had an amazing concentration of uh, uh, brilliant minds and people who would define America's relation to the world in the decades uh, uh, after that. Uh, uh, Brzezinski, of course, Henry Kissinger, uh, indeed, uh, Sam Huntington, uh, Stanley Hoffman, uh, Joe Nye, uh, who's a bit younger, uh, of course, but who came, um, Mark George Bundy, and others. And that milieu really created the um, uh, interaction between academia and policymaking, which did not exist before. You had had the inquiry by, um, uh, by President Wilson uh, trying to help him on um, settling World War I, but, but really the place uh, where the cradle of that um, mixing of academia and, uh, and policy making happened uh, at Harvard in the 50s and 60s. And uh, uh, Brzezinski indeed is a product of that. And, and, and of course what attracted him uh, to that uh, milieu was the possibility of uh, having uh, good uh, scholarship, good academic uh, uh, standards, but then to gradually move towards um, uh, towards uh, policy making, towards uh, political responsibilities, uh, etc. So what you had was really the rise of a new elite, uh, very ambitious young men, immigrants, uh, Kissinger, uh, Brzezinski, uh, and others, uh, who really redefined the rules uh, and, and, and reshaped the American uh, policy elite. You can see the gap with this, the old establishment the WASP establishment, which really disappeared with the Vietnam War, which was largely uh, blamed on, on them, uh, through, for example, the opposition between Kissinger, uh, so this new ambitious newcomer uh, with a PhD and, and, and an accent on the one hand, and William Rogers, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, whom 
pretty much everybody has forgotten because he was, of course, eclipsed by, uh, by Kissinger. And so you had this uh, uh, clash between the, the uh, traditional WASP elite and the, uh, and the new elite, or uh, the clash between uh, Brzezinski and his uh, Secretary of State, uh, so to speak, Cyrus Vance, who was also a WASP, a man from the, from the establishment. And so what I'm trying to, to show in the book is that the rules that uh, still apply in Washington, uh, young, ambitious, uh, academics uh, or think tankers trying to make it to the policy uh, world were really invented at that time with the opening also of American uh, diplomacy, the role of foundations, the role of newspapers, uh, the role of Congress, which really rose in the 60s and, uh, and 70s, opening uh, a sort of in-between world uh, where uh, people like Brzezinski and Kissinger could uh, thrive. And so the uh, uh, the arc of uh, uh, Brzezinski's biography is to move from uh, being a, a well-recognized and appreciated academic in Soviet studies. Indeed, his book, The Soviet Bloc, uh, was a must-read for anyone during the Cold War who was interested in, uh, in the communist world, um, uh, to, a, um, uh, to a more, th I would say, think tank uh, world, uh, uh, with books like uh, the Technetronic uh, Era, which was more uh, attuned to, I would say, new trends and almost uh, uh, fads meant to attract the attention of uh, policymakers and, uh, uh, and also campaigns. One important feature of this new world was that uh, these um, men started uh, advising political campaigns and trying to, uh, to, to influence and advise them, and they were co-opted by, uh, by decision makers. Of course, uh, 1968 is the crucial year when uh, Kissinger uh, advises uh, actually several campaigns, but ends up, of course, advising Nixon and being picked as national security advisor for Richard Nixon, while Brzezinski was advising Hubert Humphrey and, uh, and lost, and that was uh, an important uh, moment in his career because him, the, uh, the, uh, the immigrant uh, with the uh, unpronounceable uh, name, uh, realized that uh, Nixon had named uh, Kissinger his national security advisor and so that it could also happen uh, with, with him. And so it's, he, he tells, uh, in one of the interviews we, we, we did, he tells of, the, uh, of his uh, uh, shock at realizing how uh, you know, high he could, uh, uh, he could climb. Uh, after that, um, Brzezinski did less and less, I would say, serious academic work and started working on, more and more on current issues. Uh, he created the Trilateral Commission in 1972, 1973, uh, along with David Rockefeller, uh, and uh, he was more and more immersed in the Washington world. The, the, if you'd like, the arc of his biography is uh, uh, becoming an American at Harvard, so it's, it's basically Boston, New York, Washington, that is getter, getting closer and closer to, uh, to power. Um, having been denied tenure at Harvard in 1960, he was recruited by Columbia University, which of course was halfway to, uh, to, to Washington, where he really uh, thrived uh, and made a, a big impression at the Council on Foreign Relations, in the media, etc. And in the 1970s, really rose to another uh, level with the Trilateral Commission, and by, I would say, picking the right horse, uh, so to speak, that is uh, through the Trilateral Commission uh, being put in touch with Jimmy Carter, uh, whom no one knew at the time and no one would uh, place a bet on, uh, but of course who became the uh, Democratic candidate in 1976, making uh, Brzezinski's advisor, his uh, foreign policy advisor, and ultimately naming him um, uh, his national uh, security advisor. So the story I tell in the book is not just the, the biography of Brzezinski, it's also the story of how Washington was transformed uh, over the course of the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s with the increasing uh, um, importance of that uh, in-between world between academia and, and decision-making where uh, Kissinger and Brzezinski were uh, pioneers. Uh, uh, in the Carter administration, so, so the, the, the memory that many have of the Carter administration is one of, of failure, uh, to, be, to be honest, because of the Iran hostage uh, crisis, because of the failed uh, attempt to rescue them in 1980, because of um, the invasion of Afghanistan, because of the high inflation, which contributed a lot to, um, uh, to uh, Carter's uh, defeat. However, if you look more closely 
uh, in the course of these four years, many things were uh, achieved, and, um, and, and Brzezinski was largely uh, responsible for many of them. The Camp David Agreement, of course, and then uh, the following year, the uh, peace treaty between Egypt and, uh, and Israel, uh, the normalization of relations with China, something that the Republicans at the time could not have achieved. So, of course, uh, Nixon and Kissinger opened uh, uh, China, uh, but they could not have gone the whole way because of the uh, 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 because of the Taiwan lobby, basically in the uh, in the Republican Party, and so it took. Um, Carter and, and Brzezinski in particular to uh, uh, open this new chapter of uh, <clears throat> Chinese-American relations, going all the way to uh, sharing very important uh, uh, resources like uh, after the Iranian revolution placing uh, listening stations uh, in uh, West China, uh, so to replace the lost uh, stations in, in Iran uh, to uh, spy on the on the USSR. So a very uh, deep uh, deep connection. But um, also the Panama Canal Treaty, which would have been very difficult for the Republicans and which uh, sort of uh, fixed one of the biggest irritants uh, with Latin America, or or the human rights policy. So you know one can discuss what the impact was, but but indeed putting uh, the emphasis on human rights was one of the. Uh, great um, uh, features of the Carter administration, which uh, really made the USSR uh, uncomfortable. And using the Helsinki um, uh, process for uh, for this was uh, was seen as a, um, a sort of a strategic decision, not just a moral one, uh, which was largely the way Carter uh, saw it, but also a strategic one. After the Carter administration came what I call the age of authority. Uh, that's what um, Martin described uh, earlier. It's uh, the idea that uh, 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 Brzezinski, uh, who lasted only four years, so that's one of the difference with Kissinger is that, of course, Kissinger was uh, here the whole time during two administrations, or three, you could say, between uh, January 69 and, uh, and, and early 1977 uh, through Nixon and then uh, Ford, and then also became Secretary of State, whereas Brzezinski was, always, was only there for four years uh, as National uh, Security Advisor. However, he is... Um, uh, his importance and his uh, 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 prestige uh, was was great, and he became uh, he, he remained very active, uh, teaching at Columbia, then uh, at uh, at Zeiss, uh, being a, a fixture of the Washington um, landscape uh, or scene, and having real impact, especially on NATO, on on the uh, issue of NATO enlargement. Uh, I think uh, if there's one single person outside the uh, uh, Clinton administration who was uh, instrumental in enlarging NATO, it was uh, as big as he was known uh, by uh, by others, uh, not only because of the uh, uh, public interventions that he did and the, uh, uh, the fact that he published on the, uh, on the issue and, and pushed for it, but also because he lobbied very uh, concretely uh, for it with the Clinton administration, with uh, the Senate afterwards, uh, uh, etc. It was also... I think one of the uh, m most important figures uh, in, um, uh, in pushing back against uh, the Iraq war and criticizing the Iraq war. Basically, Zbig advised all presidents. The first political advice he gave was 1956 uh, to Hubert Humphrey, who was then uh, just a, a senator. And the last uh, advice that he gave was 60 years afterwards, was in 2016 uh, to Obama on the on, on the Middle East. So, and and in the course of that, he was in touch with all presidents uh, except uh, George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Uh, 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 after that, uh, um, uh, because he never got along with uh, with Trump uh, with uh, George W. Bush, and uh, indeed took a very um, uh, a, a very uh, critical view of the uh, of the Iraq War, and along uh, with uh, uh, with others, uh, including uh, Brent Scowcroft, was really at the forefront of the uh, uh, of pushing back against this. But all, he also intervened on many other issues. Um, Israel Palestine was uh, was very important uh, in his eyes, and 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 the job uh, done at Camp David, uh, which was of course exclusively on 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 uh, Egypt Israel relations, rather than. Uh, the Palestinian issue as a as a whole uh, for him always had to be completed by uh, another uh, agreement. So he pushed for that very very strongly. But also China, he was uh, always um, uh, interested in the role that China should play uh, and could play uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, with the U.S. And pretty much uh, like his um, uh, his sort of half brother uh, Kissinger uh, would take a very uh, positive view of uh, of China. So. You know, at the end of the day, what accounts for his 
uh, prestige, or why is he such an important figure? I, I think one one answer is his longevity. Uh, you know, 60 years of, of policy advice, a massive production of uh, uh, more than 12 books, either uh, by himself or uh, uh, co-written with uh, others, uh, Huntington uh, or the book he did with Brent Scowcroft and and uh, and David uh, and and others. So uh, a constant stream of production and an insistence on thinking hard. That is to say, uh, really being a strategist, uh, you know, it's not really a trade, it's not really a profession. It's more like a hygiene or a, uh, a practice, like a physical exercise, uh, you know, having real expertise, um, uh, vetting all the uh, possibilities, trying to project himself. He was always interested in, in, uh, uh, in projecting himself. That is to say, if you propose a policy, you have to have an idea of what the six months ahead or the years ahead uh, uh, have in store for you, because otherwise your policy is made in a vacuum. And so uh, he was nothing of a futurologist, but he was always interested in uh, making predictions because he thought that it was um, the honesty of the uh, of the analyst um, uh, implied that uh, the analyst would uh, uh, put his cards on the table and tell what the future uh, looked uh, to uh, uh, to him. Also, political independence was really important. He was uh, he was a lifelong Democrat. Uh, but he was always very independent. Uh, so in 1972, for example, uh, he really parted ways with the Democratic Party when George McGovern, uh, who in his eyes w was way too much to the left and uh, had this sort of neo-isolationist um, uh, uh, approach uh, to foreign policy, uh, so he, he broke ranks with the Democratic Party at that time. He also supported uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, Bush 41, uh, in uh, 1988 uh, because he considered that Michael Dukakis was just uh, like George McGovern was too much to the left and so he didn't hesitate to break ranks with his uh, uh, with his family and always had an independent view. Uh, he also was uh, close for example to the views of some um, uh, of the uh, nascent neoconservative movement in the 1970s but never uh, uh, never shared all of their uh, program, and indeed he was, uh, of course, at the other end of the spectrum in the Iraq war uh, 25 years uh, afterwards uh, in the early uh, 2000s. So these things explain why uh, he's such a dominant figure and why uh, also it was, uh, uh, you know, such a fascinating journey into prodding or exploring uh, America's foreign policy making uh, to write this book. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.